Greetings to one and all on this forum. I am Dr. Sanjay Andrew, Professor of Physiology from Chetnar Hospital and Research Institute in Chennai. My topic for the discussion is from action potentials to arrhythmias. So uh, what I will be doing over the next half an hour is I will be using these objectives to update you on certain core principles of electrocardiography. I shall begin with the electrophysiology of the heart giving, view, giving you an overview of what has already been discussed on this forum. And then I will go on to certain electrophysiological hallmarks. So first, I will talk to, about the electro, talk to you about the electrophysiological hallmarks seen in the ECG associated with the sinus rhythms. And then I will follow it up with the same in certain conduction disorders of the heart. And then I will give you a primary classification of arrhythmias from where my clinicians will take over and give you further inputs on the same. So we shall have a recap on the electrophysiology of the heart. The human heart is an electromechanical pump that primarily has five core physiological properties. Automaticity is the ability of the heart to spontaneously generate an impulse. Conductivity is the ability of the heart to generate this impulse throughout the conducting system. Rhythmicity is the ability of the heart to make sure that this impulse is conducted in a regularly regular fashion. Contractility is the actin myosin interaction within the cardiac myocyte and this allows the heart to contract as a whole or as a syncytium. There is another electrical property known as refractiness. Now this is the duration of an action potential where a second stimulus will not be able to generate another impulse. Now as far as understanding the ECG is concerned, you should know that most of the cardiac arrhythmias are because of a, either an increase or a decrease in the automaticity and conductivity of the heart. Refractiness is also essential to understand how arrhythmias develop. I will be talking to you about it later in the presentation. These are the five core physiological properties which we have already discussed. Automaticity is the ability of the heart to spontaneously generate an impulse. Rhythmicity is the inherent regularly regular discharge of a cardiac impulse. Conductivity is the transmission of this impulse throughout the conducting system. Contractility is contraction of the cardiac muscle as a whole. And refractiness is the inability of cardiac muscle to respond to electrical stimulation during a particular interval in its action potential. So this slide should gives you an overview of the conducting system which you might already know. So you can see the SA node is the primary pacemaker of the heart where your impulse is spontaneously generated throughout the life of a person. From the SA node, you have three internodal tracks which link up the SA node to the AV node. And the AV node continues as the bundle of his which in turn terminates as the Purkinje fibers. The bundle of his is thrown into a left bundle branch and a right bundle branch and in this diagram you can see the left bundle branch has an anterior division and a posterior division. This slide shows two important electrical properties of the heart namely rate and rhythmicity and velocity of conduction of a cardiac impulse. On this side we can see that the rate and rhythmicity of a cardiac impulse is greatest at the primary pacemaker or the sinoatrial node. And on this side we can see that the fastest uh, the velocity of cardiac impulse conduction occurs in the bundle of his and the Purkinje system and the slowest velocity of cardiac impulse conduction occurs at the atrioventricular node. This is an interesting slide which gives you an histor historical update about the discovery of the conducting system. So you can see that even though the conducting system terminates with the Purkinje fibers, the Purkinje fibers were the, were the part of the conducting system that were first discovered in 1845 and the internodal tracts were the last, the anterior, middle and posterior internodal tracts, they were the last to be discovered in 1963. Now apart from the normal conducting system which I just described, quite a proportion of the population have certain abnormal bypass fibers also known as the paranodal tracts. And here in this diagram, you can see the AV node and the bundle of his which I will be referring to as the fascicle. Now five of these abnormal or paranodal tracts have been described and here at 1 you have the James atriofascicular bundle which extends between the atrium and the bundle of his. At 2 you have the in intranodal bundle which is present in the AV node and at 3 you have Mahem's fasciculoventricular bundle which extends between the bundle of his and the ventricle and at 4 you have Mahem's nodoventricular bundle which extends between the AV node and the ventricle and at 5 you have Kent's atrioventricular bundle which extends between the atrium and the ventricle. So these paranodal tracts are sometimes responsible for certain abnormal rhythms which may be picked up in the ECG. In fact, one abnormal rhythm which is known as accelerated conduction 
is due to these paranodal tracts and I will be describing about it later in this presentation. Now this slide shows the action potentials of the various conducting tissues of the heart. In physiology whenever we describe the classical cardiac action potential, we describe the ventricular action potential with its four phases. However, stimulation of the different parts of the conducting system give different types of waveforms. For example, at the SA node you have the classical pacemaker potential which begins to evolve as we go down the conducting system into the classical ventricular action potential. So this must be kept in mind whenever we go about understanding the electrophysiology of the heart. This slide shows a classical ventricular action potential and you can see that the ventricular action potential has four phases. The first phase is the phase of depolarization of phase 0 and this is followed by the early repolarization of phase 1 and this is followed by a plateau which is phase 2 and then we have late repolarization which, which is phase 3 and finally we have phase 4 which is returning back to the resting membrane potential. The ionic basis of these phases are described on this side. So you, you can see that phase 0 is due to opening of the fast sodium channels and phase 1 is due to closing of the fast sodium channels. Phase 2 is opening of the calcium channels and phase 3 is due to closing of the calcium channels. And finally we have the return back to the resting membrane potential of phase 4. Now antiarrhythmic pharmacotherapy is widely used to manage cardiac arrhythmias and this slide shows there are four classes of drugs which are used to manage cardiac arrhythmias and on the far corner there are some examples of each. But what I would like you to understand is this section of the tabular column. So you can see that each, gr each group of drug tends to act on the cardiac action potential and try to control the arrhythmias. More on this will be told to you by our pharmacologist in subsequent sessions. This slide correlates a ventricular action potential with a normal electrocardiogram and what we can see here is the P wave has no correlation because this is a ventricular action potential. The P wave is due to atrial depolarization. Now the QRS complex corresponds with phase 0 of the ventricular action potential and phase 2 or the plateau corresponds with the ST segment of the electrocardiogram and the phase of repolarization corresponds with the T wave of the electrocardiogram. Now earlier in my presentation I had described five core properties of the heart, one of them was refractoriness. So we shall try to understand refractoriness of the ventricular action potential because it is important for our, for our understanding of how arrhythmias are generated. So the refractory period as you might be knowing is the period of the uh, action potential where a second stimulus will not be able to generate another impulse. And there are three types of refractory periods namely the effective or absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period and another phase known as the supernormal phase. The absolute refractory period extends from phase 0 up to the mid portion of phase 3. During this period even a strong second stimulus will not be able to elicit an action potential. The relative refractory period follows the absolute refractory period in the ventricular action potential and during this period a very very strong stimulus can bring about a second action potential. Now it is the last portion of the refractory period also known as the supernormal phase which is present in the phase 4 of the action potential. It is this phase from which most of the arrhythmias are generated. So during the supernormal phase the cells of cardiac muscle are hyper excitable with a single stimulus capable of producing multiple responses. I repeat it is a supernormal phase from which most of the cardiac arrhythmias are generated. There is another classification of cardiac muscle cells namely the automatic cardiac muscle cells and the non-automatic cardiac muscle cells. The automatic cardiac muscle cells are located in the SA node and the AV node and these cells spontaneously gen generate impulses while the non-automatic cells are located lower down in the conducting system and these cells depend on being excited by the SA node and the AV node. However, in certain abnormal states the non-automatic cells can become automatic. This slide shows the core differences between the automatic cells and the non-automatic cells. So here you can see the pacemaker potential which is primarily due to the automatic cells and the ventricular action potential which is primarily due to the non-automatic cells. Now, here you see the pacemaker potential has a slowly rising phase 4 and phases 1 and 2 merge with each other and this 
uh, electrical activity is predominantly calcium dependent. And here you have the ventricular action potential which is uh, sodium de de dependent predominantly and uh, you can see the different phases, phase 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4 are very clearly defined. So having told you about the um, core uh, electrophysiological properties of the heart, I am going to go on to certain electrophysiological hallmarks of the ECG associated with the sinus rhythms. Now a sinus rhythm is a, refers to a rhythm in which the heart beats sequentially and uh, normally described as regularly and irregular. The sinus rhythm usually exhibits a normal rhythm with or without altered rates. So there are three important sinus rhythms which you should be aware of namely sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia and sinus arrhythmia. So sinus tachycardia is a heart rate of regular rhythm with a rate greater than 100 per minute. So here you can see this is the tracing of a sinus tachycardia and you can see the rate has markedly increased and functionally or physiologically a sinus tachycardia is seen during exercise and periods of stress while pathologically there are states associated with the sinus tachycardia and a few examples of that is fever, anemia and hyperthyroidism. The sinus bradycardia is a heart rate of regular rhythm with a rate less than 60 per minute. So the sinus bradycardia is usually seen when the vagal tone is increased and functionally it is typically seen in well trained athletes and uh, there are certain pathological states where a sinus bradycardia may occur and uh, disorders of the conducting system as well as hypothyroidism are two examples of sinus bradycardia. So here you can see a classical sinus bradycardia where the heart rate has markedly decreased. Now the next sinus rhythm is the sinus arrhythmia which is a heart rate of regular rhythm with alternating phases of fast and slow rates. From a functional point of view or physiologically a sinus arrhythmia is usually seen in children and during the different phases of the respiratory cycle. During inspiration the heart rate increases and during expiration the heart rate decreases. Sinus arrhythmia is also associated pathologically with disordered generation of impulses in the SA node. Here you have a tracing of a sinus arrhythmia and you can see the heart rates being fast and then slowing down and then becoming fast again. So having told you about the three sinus rhythms, now I will go through an update on certain electrophysiological hallmarks which are seen in the ECG in certain conduction disorders of the heart. So we shall begin with aberrant conduction. So this is actually a refractoriness or a delay in conducting a supraventricular impulse into the ventricles and uh, it should be kept in mind when differentiating a supraventricular tachycardia from a ventricular tachycardia. So here you can see an example of aberrant conduction. So here is a ECG strip in which you see the P wave occurring after the QRS complex because of uh, aberrant conduction that is seen in this tracing. Next we have the accelerated conduction. Previously I told you about the paranodal tracks and uh, accelerated, accelerated conduction is usually seen when, whenever there is a paranodal tract in which through which an impulse bypasses the AV node. So, the classical finding of uh, accelerated conduction is a shortened PR interval and uh, this is seen in two important uh, syndromes which may be described later namely the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and the Laun-Ganong-Levin syndrome. So here you can see a tracing from a patient with Laun-Ganong-Levin syndrome and a uh, accelerated conduction and you can see the PR interval being shortened because of accelerated conduction. Then we have another disorder known as the atrioventricular dissociation. So this is actually a functional block in the AV node, functional block of conduction in the AV node. So as a result the ventricles fire at a faster rate than the atria since the AV, is refract AV node is refractory to the passage of impulses from the SA node. So here we usually see the P waves marching towards and overtaking the QRS complexes and occasionally there will be a normal rhythm known as the capture beat. So here you can see a tracing of atrioventricular dissociation you can see the P waves marching towards the QRS complexes and eventually overtaking the QRS complexes and this may be followed by a normal rhythm or isorhythmic uh, pattern known as the capture beat. There is another electrophysiological disorder known as accrochet synchrony. Here what happens is two adjacently situated cardiac tissues may fire at the same rate even though they are stimulated at different rates with a marginal difference. Now this may be seen in AV dissociation which I just now told you and usually accrochet synchrony is characterized by a positive wave following the QRS complex as you can see in this tracing.
Now we come on to the phenomenon of electromechanical dissociation or also known as pulseless electrical activity. This is a phenomenon which usually precedes death and uh, here what happens is the mechanical contraction of the heart does not occur in spite of electrical activity being recorded and usually the arterial pulse cannot be palpate, palpated in such patients and there are quite a few causes of uh, uh, electromechanical dissociation which is uh, listed out in this slide. So now we have another rhythm where there is electromechanical dissociation known as the agonal rhythm. So here we, what we have is it's a slow rhythm with wide and bizarre QRS complexes and as I told you it precedes cardiac arrest and it is a classical example of electromechanical dissociation. That is agonal rhythm is a classical exam example of electromechanical dissociation. So this is a classical tracing of a agonal rhythm. Now we come to two uh, closely related uh, uh, electrophysiological uh, abnormalities namely the ventricular bigemini and the ventricular trigemini. So the ventricular bigemini is an electrophysiological phenomenon in which a sinus beat alter alternates with an ectopic beat. So here you can see a sinus beat alternating with a ectopic beat and this is a classical tracing of a ventricular bigemini. So usually these uh, electrophysiological changes are associated with certain arrhythmias which the clinicians will be talking to you about. And this is the ventricular trigemini which I told you. So here you see two sinus beats may alternate with an ectopic beat or two ectopic beats may alternate with a sinus beat. Here you have two ectopic beats alternating with the sinus beat in this tracing. Now the next uh, electrophysiological abnormality which I would like to tell you is the blocked atrial ectopic. Now this occurs as a consequence of digital, digitalis toxicity as you all know digital is the drug used to manage cardiac failure. So what happens in the blocked atrial ectopic is the atrial premature beats they are noted in the ECG as a single entity and uh, are also known as isolated P waves. So you can see this in this tracing. Now we come on to the congenital complete heart block. It is a block in conduction of the impulses at the upper part of the atrioventricular junction. So usually the ECG is characterized by a normal rate with a narrow QRS complexes that are dissociated from the P waves. So you can see the QRS complex they narrow down and the P waves are actually dissociated from the QRS complexes. Now another type of uh, electrophysiological disorder is the concealed conduction. What happens here is certain impulses that are conducted may not be picked up on the ECG at the point where they are supposed to be picked up but they can be made out by analyzing subsequent complexes. Atrial fibrillation is an example of concealed conduction and what happens here is the PR interval following a ventricular premature beat is usually longer than normal. So here you can see the PR interval forming a ventricular ectopic can is longer than normal. So this is a example of con concealed conduction. Now decremental increment is noted to occur in the second degree AV nodal block. Here what happens is there is a delayed in conduction of impulses at the AV node and the P PR interval is initially widened but gradually begins to narrow down. That is why it is known as a decremental increment. And here you can see this tracing the PR interval is initially increased and as we go down it tends to narrow down or decrease. Now dissociated beat refers to a block in conduction of impulses at the AV node because of a ventricular premature beat being generated distally. So the ECG shows a positive P wave with a shortened PR interval. So this tracing you can make out a positive P wave with a very very short PR interval and that is known as a dissociated beat. An ectopic beat is an abnormal beat that arises outside the SA node. This could be either atrial, junctional or ventricular. So the tracing on top is a tracing of a atrial ectopic. So here you have abnormal P waves. You can see the P waves being abnormal. Then we have the junctional ectopic where the P waves are retrograde and then the ventricular ectopic where the QRS complexes are said to be bizarre. Now an escape beat occurs when the primary pacemaker of the heart that is the SA node fails to fire. As a result usually a secondary pace, pacemaker namely the AV node takes over with a single beat known as the escape beat. This can be seen in this tracing. These are all sinus rhythms and here you have the SA node failing to fire and the secondary pacemaker taking over and this is the escape beat. Now Wenke-Belz phenomenon is a commonly described entity and it usually occurs during heart blocks. 
what happens here is there is grouping of beats with an interval between the group beats. So, here is a tracing of Wenckebach's phenomenon. Here you can see three beats with an interval and then grouping of beats again. And the last electrophysiological abnormality that I will be describing to you is known as the torset de points, which refers to a ventricular arrhythmia with ventricular complexes of varying shapes. So, here you can see a tracing of torset de points. You can see the ventricular complexes are of different shapes. And usually this uh, electrophysiological disturbance is usually seen following the use of antiarrhythmic drugs. So, now that I have given you an update about certain electrophysiological disturbances which can be picked up in the ECG, I conclude this uh, presentation by giving you a primary classification of arrhythmias. So, it is useful to classify arrhythmias as sinoatrial uh, sino node arrhythmias, atrial arrhythmias, junctional or nodal arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. So, you can see I have listed out few examples at each group and uh, this will be described by my clinicians in the subsequent sessions. And as I conclude this session, I would like to thank certain people without whom this would not have been possible. So, my heartfelt thanks goes out to the flag bearers of NIPTEL for giving us this opportunity to share our knowledge with one and all on this forum. The flag bearers of Chetnar Hospital and Research Institute for always motiva motivating us to excel in our endeavors of teaching and research. My teachers and students all over the world for empowering me with the wisdom of physiology and medicine. And last but surely not the least, I would like to thank all the participants of this learning exercise. Thanks to one and all.